Well, good evening and welcome to the live stream event. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. And of course, I should say today, um, welcome to this live stream on the 18th of December 2018. Great to have you on board and uh, excellent to see so many on. Um, what I'm going to do, though, is I'm just for a little while going to ignore the live chat because what I want to do is just give you a little bit of uh, an introduction. Um, some of it is pretty standard, but I also have got a few extra charts and then we'll get into the Q&A. Um, so if you've got specific questions that you want to ask me, I'll hold on to them from, for the moment. And uh, this is uh, essentially uh, just a few slides to really cover some of the um, things that we're going to cover in more detail tonight. Um, start with the running order. So this introduction, well, you've had the introduction now. Um, I want to talk about the house rules, just a few little things. Um, I'll then talk about the models that we use because they're so fundamental to the way that we do things. I'll then just touch on a few key slides, which are sort of some updating, breaking news, as it were. And then we'll go into the Q&A. So the bulk of it will be Q&A and there'll be plenty of time to, for questions um, as we go along. And then we'll sign off and it'll be about an hour, hour and 20 minutes, probably by the time we've run through. So just the house rules, this is quite important. Um, please note, this is not financial advice. I'm not qualified to give financial advice. Um, I don't know your individual circumstances and it will be illegal for me to give financial advice. So this is just my opinion based on my research, based on what I think is going on. But to, to the extent that it's useful or valuable, you know, take it or leave it. But please um, understand it is not financial advice. Please play nice in the chat room. Um, it is actively moderated. Um, I will be uh, watching chat as it comes through. I have already taken one or two out and uh, allowed a few others to come through. So please play nice. There's plenty of excellent conversation to be had and we don't need to have um, uh, any abuse in the chat room. So please respect those rules. Um, just to re I stress again, this is the 18th of December 2018. So if you're watching this in 10 years time and the property market's gone up 200 percent, blame me. No, don't blame me. But uh, this is as at today's date. Uh, use at Walk the World to get my attention if you want to ask a question. I do have a lot of chat going on in the chat room and I won't necessarily be able to pick up every conversation and every comment feel free to have other conversations and you know other, other comments but if you want me to address something specifically use at walk the world please now in terms of the model this is just a very quick overview for those who may not have seen it before so there is a science behind what we do here we survey consumers we survey smes we survey brokers we also have data coming in from our clients and that all goes into our core industry model the 52,000 households is fair where we do our analysis and that then supports the industry reports, the channel reports, the other stuff that we do. and also includes information from industry sources um, and also trading results as well. So that's the way the model works. I've been running this model now for about 12 years and uh, it's got some AI in the middle of it to make some of the um, projections that we make. We'll touch on those a little later. And it's like a Rubik's Cube. So we can slice it and dice it by property status, by geography geography, by state, or even by our master segmentation. Now, of course, this is Australian based. Uh, we have now started to engage with New Zealand, particularly with, with Joe's help. And so there's now an interesting question going through my mind as to whether we can do something similar over in New Zealand too, but not sure about that yet. It's on the list of things to think about. Now, let me just touch on a few things. So the reserve minutes came out today. One of the reasons why we do it tonight is because we have the reserve minutes. And of course, um, guess what? They highlighted, well, firstly, they highlighted slowing global growth. This is a really changed theme from a few months ago, and all the latest um, information is now talking about slowing global growth rather than actually synchronised growth, which we had a few months ago. And it's a big change, I think. Secondly, um, they revised their GDP growth expectations around 3%. My EFO had 2.75% for next year, so there is still some downside movement in terms of the GDP growth expectations. And in fact, I think the Reserve Bank is way too positive in terms of growth. They talk about a decline in demand for off the plan apartments. We've seen that in spades through our various research programs and uh, surveys. So that's very important. Now they recognize it. And they're also making the point that over the far last five years, earnings have matched consumer prices. So 
no real change in income despite any productivity growth or anything so in many cases in fact my research says people have actually gone backwards this income problem is is probably one of the most significant uh, factors in the economy at the moment um, then they talked about a pick up in business lending mainly to large corporates um, as the banks have effectively switched away perhaps from their home lending although of course home lending is still growing um, but they also make the point that the SMEs are actually um, struggling with uh, funding a lot of SMEs are really up against it now because a lot of them are now having to use their homes for security and so going through all the same issues there and then the outlook for household consumption continues to be a source of uncertainty they say because of the growth in household income debt levels and declines in house prices well all that stuff you know if you've been watching the dfa channel but at least the reserve bank is recognizing it and then of course they say well the next move will probably be up uh, now you could argue that this was then things may have changed now but at the moment the reserve bank is still signaling a move up so that's uh, in a nutshell what the reserve bank said now just a few other quick things credit still growing at 5.1 percent this is the analyzed data from the rba so housing credit is still growing at 5.1%. That's faster than inflation. So all the talk about no credit availability is not the true story, uh, particularly for an occupation. Investors um, are growing at 1.3%. Unoccupied are 7%. Average, 5.1%. And that's actually faster than business lending. Household confidence from our surveys is in the doldrums. This is a, a chart that Ashley John Adams liked, which showed the way that household financial confidence is sliding below the 100, which is the, uh, the baseline. But actually, those who are um, mortgaged are less confident than those who aren't. So we call them those the free affluence. So they're the ones with perhaps more affluence, less mortgages or no mortgages, still got property. And both of those, though, are still more positive compared with those who are renting. So renters definitely are uh, uh, bouncing along the bottom in terms of uh, household confidence. But this is critical because it does tell you that things are actually quite tight for many people. Mortgage stress is also rising. This is the other data, of course, that we report every month. 30.9%, that's more than a million households now in mortgage stress, defined as a cap on cash flow terms. And of course, the household debt to income ratio, 190.5, it's never been higher, one of the highest in the world. And that's where a lot of our grief comes from. We've got too much debt or we're over leveraged. BBSW is another one. This is the funding. So this is the, the, the funding gap between effectively what the banks uh, are, are trying to deal with. It's gone up 23.5 basis points now from where it was back in February. It's rising again. And my expectation is that it will rise further. They haven't clawed back all of that in Australia. So the banks are sitting on margin compression. And what they're actually doing is raiding people's savings squeezing deposits, particularly term deposits, to try and square the circle. But the BBSW rates are very significant, and we monitor those on an ongoing basis. And the market, of course, had a pretty riotous day today. It went down more than 1%. But the financial sector, which is what this chart is, this is effectively the index for the financials in Australia, dropped another 1.5%. And if you look at it in long-term trend terms, it's now basically... Uh, back to where it was back in 2012, 2013. So effectively, all of the uh, movement in between has, has been lost. And my own view is there's probably more slides ahead. Now, just in terms of our scenarios, we always update our scenarios on this call, and I've run the model again, uh, coming out of the back of our, uh, our core market model. Scenarios is a way of looking at the, um, the industry, as you know. We, we use them to help discuss. We're not necessarily making a forecast, but it's illustrating how things are changing over time. And, and we've got these uh, same scenarios with business as usual, things going to get better, not yet doomsday, Armageddon, Ireland 2.0, and doomsday, Iceland 2.0. And then I've updated the uh, scenario. So the business as usual, this is effectively the Reserve Bank sort of baseline, uh, has dropped to 2% probability. Um, so there's almost no chance of what the Reserve Bank is expecting to play out. Um, and in fact, even the thing that's going to get better uh, has dropped from 30% to 25% in, in my scenario analysis here. And here we're talking about home prices down 20%, up to 20%, uh, and perhaps some easing of credit rules to try and stimulate. Um, if you go on beyond that to what I call not yet doomsday, so this is now when we're talking 20 to 30% price moves. This, this is to price moves from peak to trough. 
Um, we've now got a 45% probability weighting on this scenario playing out, up from 42.5% last time we ran the models. And uh, at this point, you've got losses rising, you've got mortgage stress rising, you've got the Reserve Bank uh, uh, rate sort of sitting around 1.5%, in other words, no, no move up. Um, then we go on to Armageddon, and this is when it gets really, really serious. So now we've got zero or 0.5%, that sort of range for the Reserve Bank rate. We've got huge amounts of mortgage stress, unemployment rising, significant bank losses, home prices down 30 to 45 percent and probably some bail-ins and bailouts going on and that's now got a 20 percent probability up from 17.5 percent and then the last one which is effectively you know, the whole thing sort of falls over zero and below interest rates high unemployment rate high levels of mortgage stress huge bank losses prices up to 80 percent that's got a five percent weighting now it's gone up from four to five percent and that tells you that the midpoint is somewhere between 20 and 30 percent in terms of home price down from peak to trough. Various bit places that you look at, Sydney, Melbourne, more than perhaps some other places, but that's quite significant and it is definitely um, higher than what many of the economists out there are saying. Uh, and I think that um, you can perhaps get a sense of, yeah, that's probably where I'm thinking, but what I'm saying is the downside beyond that is probably even more significant. So that's our latest update based on the data, literally up, uh, up till today. OK, so with that introduction, I'm now going to come back to the chat. And um, to do that, I'm going to uh, come back on to this one. Oops. Let's go back there. OK. So... Um, on the Q&A, let's have a look. I'm going to have a look back over and just see what we've got. We need to reset, somebody said. Yeah, probably do. Based on your knowledge and opinion, where would you park your money to protect it, assuming the Aussie dollar is at significant risk? That's from Joy Text when you said. Good question. Um, depends what you're, whether you're trying to do. Is it just for protection, or is it uh, essentially trying to gain from the situation? Um, it's actually quite difficult to figure out where there might be safe, because safe is relative, right? So in some cases, people are saying, well, maybe the bank deposits, and you've got to think about bail-in and bail-out. You might think about um, moving money overseas, but then you've got exchange rate, exchange rate risk. You might think of, you know, metals, but then you've got issues with storage and also with price on metals. Um, so the short answer is there is no simple solution and there's no safe place. It's all about relative risk and, you know, you'll make then a trade-off risk between different scenarios and basically different solutions. But there is no 100% copper bottom bottomed place, uh, not even under the mattress, because, of course, there, you, you know, if you have a fire, then you lose it all. So I'm afraid there's no simple answers to that question. Uh, Oliver says, I was only more 20 years ago. Yeah, there's a lot of people who actually have had no pay rises for 5, 7, 8, 10, 12 years. And in some cases now, their employment they've got is actually paying less than it was back then. We are in a very different situation. And that's partly created by the gig economy, partly created by the pressure on um, uh, wages and, um, and the fact that perhaps um, uh, many parts of the economy now are less unionised than they were. Uh, it's also worth comparing the returns from um, the commercial sector, in other words, to investors, relative to the returns to those who are actually working. And effectively, relatively, the pendulum has swung very heavily towards those who are actually investors compared with those who are actually working. And I think we've got to find a way to get the pendulum back because at the moment, many people are in multiple jobs chasing effectively enough money to try and actually keep the, the, you know, the wolf from the door, as it were. So it's a big deal. OK. Let's see what else is coming up. So <laughs> Megan was asking, how many think the global economy will crash? Well, you're raising a very interesting question there because... A lot of what I've been talking about so far is based on the local situation, right? Um, but the really interesting question is... Um, the really interesting question is the impact internationally. So there's a bunch of issues internationally 
who, which potentially will impinge on us. So I'm thinking of the Fed in the US, I'm thinking of China, I'm thinking of Brexit, and I'm thinking of a bunch of other things too, all of which potentially have uh, risks attached to them. And it's a question of to what extent are we disconnected from that, and the answer is we're not. So our banks are funded from overseas. We have more than a trillion dollars of overseas in, uh, debt. We have a lot of international investors investing in Australia. And traditionally, we've been a, quite a strong attractor of investment. And all of that is at risk, potentially, if things go a, a bit pear-shaped. And then, of course, you've got more issues with regard to the trade wars, and you've got greater degrees of defensiveness and uh, less, less sort of interest in globalization and more about uh, localization. So there's a big deal. And I think that there is a significant risk to the overall economy globally, as well as um, our own economy. We can make it up uh, quite well here in terms of actually we can create our own problems quite well without any international imp impact, uh, impacts. But my latest scenario does assume some global impact. Um, okay, let's have a look what else is going. So <laughs> the only way to survive and get ahead is to work 60 hours a week. It's killing the average fam family. That's from Goldlad. Yeah, a lot of people are working very hard. So my surveys highlight the fact that many households are really up against it. So, uh, you know, effectively there is um, pressure on household budgets thanks to fuel electricity, childcare costs, healthcare costs, all of those things. Um, income's flat in real terms, big mortgages, in some cases mortgage rates have even gone up for some people, and then no real growth in income. Um, it's looking very, very uncomfortable for many households, and that's why I talk about mortgage stress as being a significant factor for many. I also measure rental stress, about 40% 40 40 of people who are renting actually have rental stress. In other words, they're struggling to make the rental repayments on the, on the properties that they're actually living in. That's one reason why rents are not growing in real terms at all. So it's a big deal. Okay, what else have we got? Okay. Yes, so there's the normal discussion about... Um, about gold and you know there is a line of argument that gold is tangible so you can actually go go buy gold and you can hold it the problem is of course one what is the price of gold and what might the price of gold become bearing in mind that to some extent i think the gold gold price is artificially manipulated even now and two of course we've always get that old uh, that old law that the um the government can go grab gold here if they so choose it whatever price they chose. So gold's an issue, yeah, interesting question. Um, it's not without its risks though. Matt says, I got your message about whether money in offset accounts can be bailed in. Yeah, okay, let's talk about that, Matt. So, so Matt asked me, in a bail-in situation, and let's just wind back slightly. So bail-in is when a bank is failing but has not failed. And the bail-in arrangements allows um, types of assets like bonds or even deposits potentially to be converted to equity to bolster the bank's balance sheet and keep it in business. So that's what bail-in's about. And the question is, if I've got a loan, mortgage, and I've got an offset account, in a bail-in situation, how might that play out? Now, traditionally, the, the, the standard argument that a banker would say is, well, I have ultimate right of offset immediately, so I would net those off prior to any sort of bail-in arrangement if, if it was the banker talking. However, if you were the regulator, you might actually say, well, actually, this is about the sustain, sustaining the overall bank and therefore converting deposits to equity is something which may actually take preeminence over right of offset. Now, there's no case law on this. There's no words in any of the documents that I've seen to explain how this might run. My point is it's very unclear. It's another reason why we need clarity on what the bail-in provisions are in Australia, whether deposits are in or whether they're out. It's unclear. Those of you who have seen my earlier posts on bail-in will know it's all about 
any other instrument. And we also know, of course, that there are clauses in deposit accounts that allows regulators to effectively change the rules like that without any notice. So it's a big deal, and it's very unclear, Matt, I'm afraid. Um, I, I guess um, my own view would be if we started looking as though things were getting really dicey, I think my own view would be I would probably use the money in an offset account and pay down my mortgage on the principle that a more, smaller mortgage is probably a good outcome, but others may have a different view. What constitutes disposable income? That's a very interesting question. Um, sorry, just looking at... I've, I've, missed, I've missed who asked me the question. Disposable income is basically income that is available after tax. So, you know, you have, you have effectively money coming in, you've got to pay the tax man, whatever it is. It's what's left as available to cover everything that's required from paying the mortgage through to um, paying all the other bills. That's what disposable income is. It's a better measure than, than, than gross income because, of course, the um, impact of tax has a significantly different impact for different types of people. In fact, more affluent people have much better tax planning techniques and can actually manipulate their um, disposable income to make it a lot smaller <laughs> and you know that's getting into the tax engineering d debate but that's that's disposable income um, so Paul DeWitt what do I think about Peter Schiff um, yes I do watch some of what Peter says um, I think in some cases I sort of agree in some cases I don't agree I can't really debate that at the moment but perhaps um if if i can ever get peter to come and talk on the channel that would be a good thing to do and we can then chat some of those things out i think okay brenton says i'm wanting to get hold of the monthly data of price falls gains on a suburb by suburb level is the only way to get this to pay core logic okay so there is some information which you can get from realestate.com.au at a postcode level. And they actually give you trends data, uh, you can get it month on month and month, for units and houses for every postcode in the country. That is available, but it's only available by putting an individual postcode in and pulling the information out. Um, the core logic data that's publicly available is normally much higher level, and you have to actually subscribe or grab the individual data within CoreLogic. There is no place that I'm aware of that lists on a location basis across multiple locations all the different movements on a monthly basis. Um, now I have some of that data in my models but you know there's a whole lot of processes that I have to run through to get those. I actually take data from CoreLogic as part of my um, inputs, a sort of ingestion of, of data and I use that as part of the um, modeling that I use. But I use other sources too. So it's it's a good question, but there isn't a simple answer to that. And I think in New Zealand there is meant to be some information that's available, but I suspect that it's rather similar. And um, with all of this information, the question is how accurate is, is it? How long does it take to actually um, you know come through from from the data? So sorry, I can't give you a better answer than that. Okay, Katrina says, does bail-in mean we essentially become bank shareholders. Yeah, well, so so the core thinking of, of, of bail-in is what you're trying to do is to, you're trying to stop a bank from falling over completely, right? And there's a reason why people might want to do that because if you remember the deposit insurance, which we have in Australia, but not in New Zealand, it doesn't exist in New Zealand, in Australia there's this 250K deposit insurance which is available if a bank folds completely, right? But bail-in is prior to a bank failing them. Not to, they're not the same thing. And it's interesting how quite often when MPs answer the question of bail-in, they end up talking about bank deposits, which is completely different. So, so far as bail-in is concerned, it's a bank that's in distress. They then grab some other classes of, of assets and essentially convert them into equity to be able to bolster the balance sheet of the bank. That's what it's about. And the idea is that, you know, equity varies in terms of its value it might go up might go down um, what which means that you might actually find that your deposit is worth less and in fact there are 
in Crete where there was a bail-in, um, people ended up losing quite a lot of their deposits as part of that process. So that's, that's what the rationale is. And underpinning it is the G20. So they basically a few years ago cooked this up as an alternative to um, uh, uh, the government bailout of a bank, which the other way of doing it is effectively you get public money thrown at a bank to keep it afloat, which is what happened in Europe and in, in, in the US. Um, the trouble about that is it's a huge impost on the economy. And, you know, you could argue that many economies around the world who bailed uh, out banks are still trying to deal with the, with the ramifications. We've done several posts on this, if you want to look at them, um, highlighting the quantum involved. So basically the G20 came up with an alternative. And in fact, it was a couple of um, bankers who came up with this idea of deposit bail-in. Well, that's where it came from, I think, from Credit Suisse, as I recall. Um, and it's sort of now taken flight. Um, the Financial Stability Board basically put the paper out, the G20 endorsed it. And that's basically it's law in a number of countries. It's law in New Zealand. So there you've got um, your open banking resolution. Uh, it's law in Canada. It's in Europe, in the UK. And sort of in Australia, although in Australia, as you may know from our earlier conversations uh, and, and posts, the problem is that it's very fuzzy, so it's not clear precisely what's in and what's out. We know that some types of securities are definitely bailable, and the question is, is deposits? But the short answer is it would be converted into um, capital, and that bolsters the, the bank effectively, so you become a shareholder of the bank rather than a depositor. And underpinning it, is the concept that a deposit is effectively an unsecured loan that you make to the bank. Now, that may sound really weird because a lot of people will just say, well, aren't I giving my money to the bank for safekeeping? And the answer is no, not really. What you're doing is you're making an unsecured loan to the bank. Now, think about that. Unsecured means there is no security behind it. And the rates of return that we are getting on deposits around the world, but particularly in Australia, are so, so low, it doesn't actually represent the risk that is really there. And, of course, in New Zealand, where the bail-in arrangements are even more crystal clear, now the Reserve Bank in New Zealand provides a, a dashboard, a scorecard, so that people can actually make a, 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 an equation of the different risks of different lenders and work out where to put their deposits because not all banks are equal. In Australia, we don't have that information. I did a post the other day about sheep, sheep and goats and made the point that it's very hard to get really good information about that in Australia. So therefore, yeah, you become a shareholder of the bank um, by default. And the idea is that that means that the bank doesn't fall over, which means that you then don't have the deposit insurance scheme or anything else. But that's the way it works. OK, Ian's asked, how do your scenarios impact super funds? Yeah, good question. So super funds. Now, the question with super funds is where are they invested? So a lot of them will have um, a portfolio of investments, which will include the equity markets, some bonds, some cash, maybe some offshore, depending on your risk profile. So the super is effectively in different asset classes. And the question is, what happens to the asset classes in a crisis? Well, the answer is we know that stock prices will drop. We know that the bonds may go up, they may go down, depending on, on the circumstances. We know that uh, other asset classes are also at risk. So there is no guarantee with regard to the overall value of superannuation. Now, that that's sitting in deposit accounts in some situations might be um, something which is secured by the deposit guarantee in a failed bank situation. Or I suppose you could also argue in a bail-in situation, um, you know, those deposit accounts could actually be grabbed. So superannuation, I think, is a risk. And I'm not sure that people understand the potential risks in the super system that we have. Um, you know, it's more than $2 trillion. But it's invested in other things, asset classes, and those asset classes are market exposed. Okay, there, this is from Daryl. There's rumblings. Whoops. Missed. Sorry. I moved my finger and I lost it. Uh, let me 
try and get it back. Sorry. Uh, okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the one about rumblings. I'm not sure that I can. Oh, there we are. This is from Daryl. There is rumblings that the central banking system is currently looking like crumbling with an audit like it's been conducted on the Federal Reserve. Ramifications of property. Okay, great question. Yeah, so th here's the thing. The central, bank the central banking system is, of course, in the US, privately owned. So the Fed and the other central banks, the Fed structures in the US are privately owned. So they're not actually government uh, controlled the same way as, for example, in Australia. So the Reserve Bank in Australia is actually owned by Australia, basically. And in fact, the Reserve Bank, when it makes a profit, as it does some years, it passes it back to the government. So the Reserve Bank here is not privately owned. In other places it is, and that raises some very interesting questions, particularly in the US, with what the Fed is for and how it works. And there are other examples around the world where, in fact, perhaps some of the um, dynamics of the way central banks work are a little bit suspect too. And so there is some talk about um, having extra forensic analysis of some of these players. Now, there's an implication of that, of course, because if, in fact, we discover that the central banks and the way that they are operating and the assets and liabilities that they hold are not as advertised, that could create considerable uncertainty. And I think it's probably that market risk, which is the most considerable risk relating to the question of property. So any uncertainty, particularly uh, levels of trust or no trust between entities, has uh, a, a significant impact on liquidity. Liquidity is something which effectively flows around the international banking system and allows the cogs to turn the way that they've turned for a generation or two. But if that liquidity dries up because people no longer trust, then at that point, a lot of things go terribly, terribly wrong. And, you know, that's what happened in the GFC. We had a liquidity crisis, effectively, and that created then the fall in home prices. So I think you could assume that home prices would, would, would take a significant dive. OK, let's go down my list. This is from Tobes family. Any comment on fintech lending and its effects on the Australian residential property market? Yeah, interesting question. Yeah, the, the short answer is I, I'm, I'm sort of involved with a few fintechs and, and advise a few fintechs, and I've been looking at this sector of the market for quite some time. And there are some amazing um, models there uh, which are looking quite interesting. Now, of course, the fintechs are still quite small. They, they now are able to get some um, preliminary banking licenses from APRA if they need, need that. And ASIC has also given a bit of an on-ramp to the fintech sector. So that it, it is, has some potential. The question is, how could it play out? So it could play out around a few things. Firstly, some of the fintech models provide different funding models. So effectively um, matching, for example, individual buyers and sellers and creating a transaction. So rather than going through an intermediary, you actually create a, a set of direct relationships. Other fintechs are actually looking to financialize further property and, and, and sell bits of properties. Um, I personally have a bit of a problem with that because I think we're just creating more of a financialized world rather than less one. But the third is also the advice um, and if you're not navigation around solutions. And I think that some fintechs could do some quite, quite work, good work there. So my own view is the fintech sector is one to watch. Not very big here yet. It's developing quite quickly. And there are some interesting business models. Um, would it ultimately disrupt the main game? Not in the short term, but in the medium term, it has the potential. Okay, um, somebody's here asked, do you foresee RBA decreasing interest rates? Okay, um, yes. My own view is that the next move in interest rates from the RBA is more likely to be down than up the RBA, down rather than up. And that's because... Um, there is very little wriggle room. We, we've basically got very little ammunition in the system now with interest rates already so low. And we know that growth is weaker than we expect. We know that income is not growing very fast. We know that home prices are sliding. We know that um, the overall momentum in the economy is not what we want it to be. And, and there are not many levers that 
the Reserve Bank has. They do have the interest rate lever and they can take the interest rate a little lower. Of course, the point there is the cash rate doesn't have much to do with the mortgage rates anymore because of the way that mortgages are funded from international markets. Those fund costs are going up, not down. And the second point to make is that there is a lower bounds, right? Because once you start taking um, rates more and more negative, you go to zero and then minus, you, you then move into zero or negative interest rate zones. And there's some work that's been done to suggest that whilst you can go f into negative a little, there's a point beyond which you, 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 you can't go because you get no benefit. And the final point is even if you take rates lower, there's absolutely no guarantee that those are actually passed through and it will have much different. So my own view is that there will be rate cuts, which will not have a major impact. There will be quantitative easing, so basically putting more money in the system to try and actually support the, the system, and that will potentially create um, um, greater inflation and uh, asset bubbles again, but that probably will not be very successful. And essentially, that's one of the reasons why in my sort of more extreme scenarios, we actually think that things go pretty pear-shaped, and it's because effectively there is little firepower. And I know the Reserve Bank the other day did say, well, we've got plenty of firepower, we can do QE and we can take rates lower. And the answer is, well, they can to an extent. But my own view is that there isn't a huge amount of leverage that they can create off the back of it. So I think we're in a rather uncomfortable situation. That's one of the reasons why the Fed is so committed to trying to raise rates to get them back to more normal levels to give them a bit more firepower for the next crisis. Unfortunately, what we've done is we've shot our locker effectively and we've got not much left in the locker. So that's the problem. Okay. Prices drop to low depression. Yes, Bruce, I think that's right. So I, I'm of the... I'm of the view that we're going to see a continued drift down in home prices. We're going to see the economy continue to weaken. We're going to see cracks appearing. We're going to see defaults beginning to rise. You know, I can give you lots of reasons why things are going to get worse. I really struggle to find a narrative that actually can be optimistic because, you know, OK, migration. Well, migration is there, but it's not sufficient to mop up all of the supply of property that we've got. Um, could we see... Incomes really start to take off. Well, maybe, but you know, we're not seeing much evidence of that at the moment. Um, and everywhere I look, I can see reasons why things are going to go less good. It's very tough for me to see things go more good, which is why I tend to be on the negative side of things at the moment. It's not my natural disposition, by the way. It's just the way that um, the data is um, is representing itself. And it's a, it becomes a bit of a question as to whether we're going to have a, a slow Japan-type grind over you know a generation or whether we're going to have a more severe fall and then perhaps some sort of recovery now there are arguments for saying if we're going to have a fall we might do better to have a deeper fall earlier and then sort of you know reset and go forward rather than try and keep the the balloon in the air and and just grind forward like japan has done because I think that un fundamentally the Japanese economy is still dealing with the precise the same issues that they were um, a decade or two ago. Okay, what else is going on? Um, so Genevieve suggests a bit of everything is good. A bit here, a bit there. Yeah, you're probably right. You know, the, the point there, of course, is that spreading the risks is, is normally good, right? So, so basically the portfolio view of the world is that you you invest a bit here you put a bit over there you, you know you cover your risks you don't put all your, all your assets in the property or any other basket what you try and do is to try and spread the risks and generally you know you have to say that that's probably reasonable advice the problem is in the current environment where so many asset classes are are, are, are overblown and are likely to correct the question is do you just spread the the risk but also um, not necessarily um, mitigate the risk and that's that's the dilemma i fear okay um i noticed a lot of conversations about um bitcoin well no one's asked me about bitcoin specifically so i'm not going to talk about that now uh, matt uh marty grover i think said stagflation yep could well be that could certainly be one of the things that we see uh, in a way you know we, we're, we've already got some of the early signs of that with such low wage growth with asset prices falling I mean, look at property prices, you know, they're going to continue to slide. Um, the confidence in the economy, um, driven by the wealth effect, is positive on the way up. 
So effectively, people spend more because they've got more, you know, property prices rising, but the reverse is also true. And effectively, as confidence ebbs away, it tends to actually reduce consumption. Um, consumption, of course, has been a critical component of the Australian economy for a long time. Interestingly, in the US, it's two thirds of the economy in the US is consumption led. It's not quite that high here, but it's not it's not far not far behind. So the US is completely sort of wired into consumption, but stagflation is certainly a potential outcome, I think. Okay, world oil reserves. This is from Goldlad, estimated to run out in 55 years' time. Will it be another Mad Max scenario? <laughs> <laughs> maybe you could have this as your final column <laughs> you well yeah um now there's a big discussion about energy and the environment and all those things and you know we've touched on this a few times in a dfa my own perspective is, is simply this that we have to find a way to shift the momentum in the economy um to alternatives that actually are more sustainable and uh, uh, available into the future and uh, the you know the oil conundrum at the moment is of course prices are quite low there in the US. The WTI is about fifty US dollars, um, which is quite low, and that's partly because of production in the US and partly because um, OPEC can't actually control the way that it used to, and Russia's still um, providing oil. But you know the the whole oil question is, I think, a strategic one insofar that the right answer is to try and wean ourselves off it over time not only because of the global warming, but also because of the systemic risk that you touch on. Okay. Now, the new voice eight. What is the chance of a so-called soft landing? Noting it looks like the stock markets may crash, as well as potentially New Zealand, UK, US, Canadian and Chinese housing markets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a soft landing is what people talk about when they don't know what else to say. They basically are hopeful that, well, you know, we'll drift lower, but, you know, all the signs are there that the rate of decline is slowing. and it'll... There is no evidence in any of the data that I see of any sign of a soft landing. In fact, the rate of house price falls in Sydney and Melbourne are accelerating. The auction clearance rates are continuing to fall. Um, and, I, you know, you could go on. So, so... I think that it's a little bit of a fool's paradise at the moment. Um, it, I've studied a lot of home price crashes over the, over the years, and I've looked at other financial crises as well. And I have not seen any successful examples of managing a soft landing. We always get a significant decline at some point. And the question really is what shape of decline? Is it one of those over a number of years, or is it more precipitous? Um, and Harry Dent, for example, says you will know when there is actually a, a real correction because you're going to see a 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40 percent fall. Then you'll know and until you see that you won't know whether it's a, a really is a, a real full down crisis or whether it's just a sort of a, you know, up and down. Um, I sort of agree with that, but I really am struggling given the pressures we've got in New Zealand, in Australia, Canada. The UK, so UK just came out with um, a very bad piece of news on home prices there as well. Um, China, retail spending down. Um, there are so many negative indicators. And if you put them all together, you start to think, hmm, 1929, <laughs> I fear. I uh, hope I'm wrong. But, um, you know, what's interesting is that some of the strategies that were being talked about pre-1929 are being talked about again. So... I'm a bit worried that we might um, see history rhyming, if not repeating. OK, um, what do you think of the looming large amount of Brisbane apartment completions that will come on Brisbane house prices? Sorry, I haven't read that very well. What do you think the impact of the looming large pro amount of Brisbane apartment completions will have on Brisbane house prices? Good question. Uh, that's from Maca2225. Um, look, there is a lot of development in and around Brisbane CBD and just beyond. Uh, a lot of those apartments are being constructed and many of them are now being offered at prices which are 15 to 20% below where they were offered a year ago. 
In some cases, people have bought off the plans at those higher rates, and then when they try to get a bank mortgage, it's lower because the valuations have dropped. I think the supply is remarkably strong over the next year or so, although I have noted also that some builders have slowed the construction rate to try and actually um, you know, maintain the uh, pipeline a little better. It's going to have a very significant impact on unit prices, particularly in and around the CBD. So I'm expecting those to drive quite a lot down from where they are. House prices, in other words, things that aren't in high rise but actually are standalone, I think are more sustainable um, insofar that there is a more limited supply. There's still quite some demand. But even there, my expectation is that home prices will also slide. And we're also seeing evidence of that in the satellite areas around Brisbane. Um, I'm particularly worried about places like um, Toowoomba, for example, and places like that where we're seeing mortgage stress very high. And I'm also worried about what I'm seeing in the Sunshine Coast and uh, on the Gold Coast, where there's been massive um, construction, massive overbuilding, and very, very high prices. And some of those are coming back too. So I think that the southeast of Queensland is going to go in for a quite a bumpy ride. And I do think that the units in and around the, uh, the main part of um, the Brisbane CBD are up for a, a bit of a fall simply because of that supply. There's, and it's interesting to note that we've got you know, a very significant number coming on stream over the next little while. OK, so somebody is suggesting that John Abdon should be PM. <laughs> Luke says, when are you going to start a political party? Uh, it's not really my bag, frankly. Um, I think there are others probably better placed to do that. I think that my niche here is to use data to try and actually inform and educate and help people to understand rather than actually that. But that's just my own. That's my own view, I guess. Um, OK, DV says, if detailed property information is widely, was widely available, then the wrong people would get it and report on it. <laughs> You're quite right. That's a very good. The amount of information that is restricted is quite remarkable. And if you look carefully, there are certain ways that the information is presented through certain channels into the mainstream media and those things. I mean, auction clearance rates is a classic example. Um, you know, remember that you can't really just think about auction clearance rates, but you've got to think about the volume as well. Volumes are way down. The number of transactions are way down. And yet that's hardly ever reported. It's always the auction clearance rate. And then if you look carefully at the way that the auction clearance rates are calculated vis-a-vis -vis, um, the number listed, the number actually that are uh, sold and those withdrawn, then you can see there are holes in the numbers too. So, that, so there are various aspects of the data which tells you that you're not getting the full story. And what I try to do in some of my posts is to try and, if you like, give you the alternate perspective. If you want to look further at auction clearance stats, I've done a couple of posts earlier in the year specifically on that and why we can't trust them. OK, John Fowler said, if the four major banks' total capital is less than 10%, what happens when the housing market drops to 15 to 20%? OK, good question, John. Now, here's the thing, right? The bank has lent a loan. The loan is on a property, and there will be an equity amount between the amount of the loan and the value of the property, the loan to value ratio. Now, typically what happens is, you know, let's say the bank lends at 80% of the property price. So 20% is actually then the equity that the uh, individual or household puts in. That's what goes first. So in a, in a fall, that's what goes first. And people need to understand that in a falling market, the bank doesn't lose first, you lose first because you're losing equity. And that's really painful. There is a point at which you then move into negative equity, and that means that the value of the loan is more than the value of the property. When that drops down, the question is, what does the bank do? Because at the moment, the banks do not reassess the value of the property unless there's a subsequent transaction. So they basically take the data that was there when the property was actually originally underwritten. And what that means is that we've got now a situation where the banks potentially are sitting on property values that are actually above what they really are. That's one of the reasons why a lot of the bank uh, economists don't want to talk about negative um, movements in price because they might be forced then to actually revalue those properties. So that's the first point. The second point is that negative equity 
is a theoretical problem. It's a, it's a paper problem until somebody goes to sell. And then when they sell, they're stuck with effectively a, a loan that they can't repay. So there is not a direct correlation between a slide in property values and the bank's capital. Right? And the final point is that the way that the bank capital works, it's not even 100% of the value because there's a thing called a risk-weighted asset. Right, And so some property um, will require a risk-weighted asset, not of 100%, but a much lower proportion. So in the case when they actually go wrong, the amount that the bank actually needs to put aside will be a lot lower than the full value that's dropped. So effectively, home price falls of 20% doesn't have an impact to the banks at 20%. It's much, much smaller. Okay. And in fact, the thing that is the most critical trigger for the banks is actually um, people who are defaulting. If defaults rise, they then have to put provisions aside for those. And that then requires 100% capital weight for those provisions. And that has a significantly bigger impact on the bank. So in fact, it's income growth or lack of it, unemployment rising, um, defaults. Those are the things that have a much greater direct impact. Home prices are a more theoretical problem until people need to move. And of course, in the UK, where there was a very significant shift into negative equity, a decade later, many households are still stuck in the same property with a value that's still below where it was when they got their original mortgage and are still in negative equity. And that's the problem. It's a long term issue, but it doesn't necessarily impact the bank's capital directly immediately. Joseph Wilkes says data in Australia is awful. In the UK, everything is recorded in public via land registry and net house prices and right move. The data is easy to collect and share. Agreed, uh, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. I came to Australia some years ago and I was horrified at the lack of really good information that was here. And it's no better now, I'm afraid. Damien says, would any of your data be a useful resource for those looking to purchase in the future, watching the increasing mortgage stress in a particular postcode? Yeah, possibly. Um, there are actually a couple of sites that show distressed property prices and particular assets. Um, do a, if you do a Google search, you'll, you'll see them. Um, what I'm looking for here is mortgage stress is an 18 month to two year indicator of future problems ahead because when people get into mortgage stress, they don't default immediately. It takes 18 months to two years, but it's a financial pressure that's building and building and building until the dam bursts and they have to do something. So it's a forward looking indicator of the level of defaults and home prices 18 months to two years out. So it does give you a forward view. And in fact, uh, if you look on the website, uh, you can see that there are the top 20 postcodes that I list each month, uh, which are the ones where the more highest stress is there. Those are ones to look at if you're thinking of you know, value later, possibly. Um, and I also, of course, do a regular um, video blog where I go through the top uh, 10 postcodes. Again, highlighting those with the, the biggest uh, potential mortgage stress issues. Okay, what else have we got? Trevor says, is, is bail-in possible for member-owned banks and credit unions? Um, well, the answer is we don't quite know. All ADIs, I, I, all banks, are potentially looked after by APRA. APRA was the guys who basically created the the structure around the, the bailing you know, under the APRA Act, which was the thing that was passed back in February and um, had this uh, any other instrument thing. So my own theory is that mutuals and credit unions um, have potential risks with regard to bailing. But as I did a post the other day, I made the point that they have much higher capital and they are less exposed to derivatives and they're less exposed from a... Um, a risk perspective in other ways too. So my own view is that some of those smaller players are significantly less risky compared with the larger ones. Uh, but of course, you can also go argue the other way, which is to say that if one of the big four got into difficulty, the chances are that the government will probably have to bail them out in some way or other, whatever that will be, we don't know, because they're too big to fail. Whereas in fact, smaller entities could be allowed to trip over. So it's a little bit of a, you know, 
Downed if you do, downed if you back down. But my own perspective is that some of those smaller players are considerably less risky and therefore less likely to be bailed in um, because they wouldn't have the same issues. Okay, what else have we got? Are the mistakes, this is from Tony Turner, are the mistakes of the central banks genuine or is there more to it? Okay, so Tony. <laughs> okay, so I talk to people sometimes who say there is a shadowy entity sitting behind the central banks and behind global governments pulling the strings and effectively there's a master plan that's going to get everybody into massive amounts of debt and then basically make a killing. I mean, that's, you know, no, I, I don't believe it, right? I'm a, I believe more in the cock-up theory of history rather than actually the conspiracy theory. There is a set of common values, which is basically, um, you know, the, 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 the neoliberal view of the way that economies work and the fact that we should privatise it all and we should actually uh, let the banks have their day and all that sort of stuff. Um, that is widely held amongst central bankers and amongst um, uh, politicians in, in a whole bunch of different countries, and therefore there's a bunch of similarities in the way that they behave. And even the central coordinating functions like the Bank of International Settlements and the Financial Stability Board have those same sets of values. Although, interestingly, the Bank of International Settlements is now starting to throw rocks at some of the behaviours. give you one little example. They made the point the other day that um, there's a lot of window dressing being done at the end of the quarter when banks are required to report their ratios so they're now saying they want to change it so it's an average across a quarter rather than just a day so one example so i don't think that there's actually you know something shadowy behind that's calling all the shots i think there's a, there's greed i think there's a common set of values there's a view that um the um the, the wealthy uh, component uh, um seem to be able to actually get ever, ever more wealthier on the back of everybody else, but that's more to do with the way that um, capitalism has been allowed to run. I don't think that there is something else behind that. Could be wrong, and others will claim that I'm being naive, but, you know, as I say, I believe in the cock-up theory of history. OK, what else have we got? Uh... OK. Why don't the this is from Mac Dad. Why don't the badly behaved banks get charged? I assume you mean from a legal perspective. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting question. If you go back to the 2008 crash in the US, almost no bankers were ever sent to court, uh, prosecuted for their massively bad behavior. And in fact, the banking system and the government was so close in the US that a lot, there was a lot of open doors between the two, right? So a lot of the central bankers um, were actually ex-bankers. And so not surprisingly, the solutions they come up with are actually designed to protect the banking system to behave the way it uh, has and continues to behave. Now, it will be interesting to see whether the um, review which will report in February, of course, the Royal Commission, whether they will actually come as far as recommending criminal proceedings. Because you could argue that the evidence over the last few months was that there were banks and bankers who were deliberately doing the wrong thing, and you know, transparently so. I don't know. I think it will be actually good for the banking system if, in fact, some of the, those people were actually hauled over the coals and actually people realise that there is a legal framework for a reason, like responsible lending. Responsible lending is there for a reason. It's not just there to tick the boxes. And yet most people in the banking system who sort of knew what responsible lending was about, you know, skated around it. So it's a behavioural question. And I actually think we need to think about structural alternatives to the banking system because I don't think the banks are capable of converting their own behaviour from the inside. I think a lot of the senior people inside the banking system are captured by a particular way of thinking. So we need to find alternative models, uh, which effectively swings banking back into something which supports the broader economy and supports the broader community and isn't just about maximising returns to shareholders. And that takes you to a really interesting question, right? Because, of course, the model is in the privatised banking world to maximise returns to shareholders at all costs. 
Never mind if you actually break rules in the process, frankly. That needs to change. And there has to be some checks and balances about behavior and about doing the right thing for, for customers. And by the way, all the research that I've done suggests that those banks who really are customer focused and really do focus on delivering the right outcomes to customers in the long term can actually still return good returns to shareholders as well. But that's another story. Okay, what else have we got? Do you pay your survey participants? That's what I'm still happy. No, I don't. Um, the way it works is that the surveys are executed on my behalf as part of an omnibus research program by one of the big research companies in Australia. So they ask a whole bunch of questions, including my questions and other people's questions. Um, but I don't pay any individuals for their survey responses. Um, I just get a statistically optimized, robust set of data back each month, which I then run through my model. So that's the way it works. Okay. This is God Lad. Do you have a top 20 to 30 worst suburbs for mortgage stress? Was there any Latrobe Valley towns? Um, yes, God Lad. It depends whether you mean by total number or whether you, you mean proportion of households in stress. Um, if you want to send me a separate email with regards to the area that you're interested in, I can tell you precisely the, the data on that because I have it down to a postcode level. It may well be that the population footprint is not big enough to be in the top 20 or 30 nationally, but um, I can certainly answer that. Okay, that's what else have we got. David, David Silverweb, the RBA sets the rate at 1.5%, yet the Aussie banks have to borrow at a higher rate from overseas. Why? Good question, David. Short answer is that the cash rate has very little to do with the real funding rates for the banks these days. They are paying a lot more, particularly for the fact that LIBOR's going up. The um, BBSW, as I showed you earlier on, is that the bank bill swap rate is going up. Um, and they're having to pay more because effectively foreign investors are now are putting a risk weight premium on Australian banks. So they're having to pay more. That's very disconnected from the cash rate. And, and because of the fact that 30 to 40 percent of bank um, loans are effectively linked to overseas investments rather than deposits, there is not a direct correlation between the local cash rate. So you could argue that the Reserve Bank is pulling this interest rate lever and it's not really connected to much anymore. And of course, we saw several out of cycle rate rises previously. Um, less rate cuts. But the other side of the equation, just to complete the story, is that deposit rates are being absolutely hammered. So if you check, if you've got a term deposit, check your term deposit rate, you'll discover that it's significantly down than where it was, particularly call accounts, actually, um, but even term deposit accounts, uh, because effectively what the banks are doing is they're discovering that they can squeeze the deposit rates uh, to bolster their margins more easily than they can change the mortgage rate because every time they change the mortgage rate they get hit over the head bar with a four by two because of course they're really sensitive to mortgage rates which is wacky because a third of the population who have no mortgage are very reliant on deposits and yet it's a silent majority and I never understood why it is that the silent majority just accept these very very low deposit rates seemed weird to me but... okay what else have we got OK, this is from Anthony Brown. If we get a scenario four or five, could our household debt to income percentage go under 100 percent? OK, so the question is, what happens if we get a crash? Right. So we know home prices will fall. The question is, what happens to the debt? Right. Because there's a couple of scenarios. One is nothing changes and the debt still stays the same, which meant that it would mean effectively that the ratio of debt to everything else will go even higher. Or we may have to consider some sort of debt reset or even debt jubilee to quote Steve King. And debt jubilee is basically forgiving of, of debt because effectively the theory that's out there is that in this environment the debt has got so big that it will never be paid off and it will be a continuous burning burden to the society and to the economy and therefore it needs to be handled. So it depends I think on how this all plays out and there are people seriously looking at you know, after a crash, how do you handle the debt? You know, do you actually reset it to zero or reset it to a smaller amount? Um, there's a thing called the Chicago plan, which I've done some uh, posts on a few months ago, which is effectively trying to think about what you could do about that. Steve Keen's 
Jack Jubilee is another idea. So there are various alternatives, and you know how that plays out will give you a different answer, I think. <laughs> Carl says, "Is that your kitchen behind you?" Well, actually, I'm downstairs in the pool room. Um, we have a big room here, which is the studio as well. But behind me, there is actually um, some kitchen units because there is a small kitchen in the corner. Bail in question. Will the banks repay the bail in funds stolen from depositors once they're on their feet again? Well, very interesting question. That's from Tis Not. Tis Not My Name. Very interesting. Very good. Um, the short answer is nobody knows. So in the case of um, Greece, Crete, um, they got a proportion back. In New Zealand, the um, official story from the Reserve Bank in New Zealand is they'll take the deposits, they'll use the deposits to refix the bank, and then they'll give you back some or all, so nobody quite knows. Okay. So, this is from IS um, Kundi. So we might be facing our own decade of financial repression. Well, it's certainly very different, right? It could well be that we're going to find it much tougher to um, borrow, much tougher to get credit, much tougher to be able to do a whole bunch of things. So, um, yeah, it's looking to me as though we're going to have a long, slow grind. I mean, Japan, I think, is an interesting model. The Japan economy is not doing too badly, but if you look at asset growth and if you look at other things too it's actually you know not performing hugely well um we do have of course resources here and providing that the resources are still being bought by china and other places we've still got a little bit of a get out of jail card and of course that's what the maifo showed that effectively the um budget looks a lot better because of the fact that people have been buying more of our commodities than perhaps we expected at a better price but that's a very risky one trick pony and the question is what else have we got in the locker and i keep saying to people we need an alternative strategy for our economy to try and deal with some of these things and one of the reasons why dfa is here is to try and actually get some of these discussions going before everything sort of turns to custard right because there is still a chance that we can actually pull some levers and do some things differently and get a different outcome the trouble is the more we leave it the more our politicians just sort of carry on regardless um, the less chance there is of fixing it. Okay. What would the banks do if depositors started extracting deposits in cash? Would they improve the interest rate to attract cash back? It's an interesting question. So we certainly have seen um, scenarios where, um, you know, bank, I guess... Northern Rock was a good example in the UK, where effectively if you lost confidence in a particular bank and actually queued to get money out. Now, of course, it's quite hard to get money out. So if you try and go to your bank and get a larger money out, amount of money out, they'll say things like, we need notice, um, not least because they don't hold a lot of cash in the, in, in the, um, the bank necessarily these days. Um, if you go to an ATM, there's a limit as to what you can draw out you know, in a day. Um, it's actually quite difficult to get large amounts of cash out. So you know, some, some would say that's just, you know, operational reasons. Some others would say, well, maybe there's a bit more to it than that. And, of course, it's interesting that in the UK, they're talking about reducing the supply of large banknotes to, again, make it a little bit more difficult to, um, to, to sort of move large amounts of money around. And they're using the example of um, the black economy as a, a reason for doing it. So effectively trying to you know, work within the system rather than around it. Um, the short answer is, it's really quite difficult to know, but I'm not sure that um, banks would respond that well if, in fact, um, people said, well, give me a higher rate or I take my money out. Um, but it would be interesting to see. At the moment, if you look carefully, there are a small number of players who offer slightly better rates, but, you know, they're all marching to the same beat and one of the things i've said to some of the clients that i've worked with over the years is you should be different what you should be doing here is trying to offer a different proposition you know a better rate or better still if you see that somebody's not getting the rate that they could get tell them offer them the better rate because that's a different cultural norm than what we've got at the moment at the moment the banks try and get away with blue murder and try and you know price their deposits as low as possible. There is an alternative model. 
Okay, what else have we got? Whoops. What would you personally do to protect your assets? Where is your money invested? I assume the... <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is from Marcus. Yeah, well, okay. So, yes, I, um, I don't have a mortgage. Um, I made it my imperative to pay the mortgage off as soon as I absolutely could because I hated paying interest on it and I wanted it to to be effectively mortgage-free. So, yeah, and look, I've ridden the value up a little. I'll ride the value down a little. At least it's mine and, you know, nobody can take it off me. Um, what I've then done, personally, is I've actually gone to liquid... So I've, li I've liquidated a number of other assets and I've tended to slice them and dice them and put them into different organisations below the insured amount on deposit. And I also have got um, a little bit uh, in the US as well, thinking that the US is an interesting angle from a exchange rate perspective, but not very much. And a little bit in the U UK, same reason. That's more of a speculation. So that's what I've done. But I don't, I don't hold gold. I don't hold silver. Um, for the reasons I've explained earlier on, for me, it's too unknown as to what the risk is, what the value is and what the outcome might be. So that's just my own view. You know, I'm not saying it's right, but that's just what I've, what I've done. OK, Eric says these conspiracy theories that everything wrong is. <laughs> yes, um, I'm not going to sort of read the whole thing, but yeah, there are people who hold conspiracy theories about the banking system. As I say, I think it's more to do with the fact that there's a common set of behavioural norms rather than a conspiracy theory. That's just my own theory. OK. Um, OK, you know, that's an interesting one. Um, hope lives on. There is talk that the US may go back to a gold standard. Um, should we follow? <laughs> Uh, talk to John Adams. So, look, the fact is, money at the moment is disconnected from real value. John did a great um, video on this a few months ago, right? And in fact, the value of money can go up, but in real terms it's not. So, effectively, the, what's happening is that there's a real devaluation going on because there's nothing supporting it. So, the argument is if you have something tangible like gold, you have the chance then of anchoring it and therefore you get real value. That's, that's the argument. Um, there have been various attempts over the years in various countries to go back onto a gold standard, but then they've broken it and come off it again uh, and then just inflated the economy. Um, the 3% CPI, you know, it just grows and grows and grows and grows. And that's really the key question, right? So effectively, if you think the future is perpetual growth, then anchoring it to something tangible isn't necessarily that sensible. But my own view is if you want to find an alternative model for the way that a banking system can work, then there isn't definitely a place for anchoring to something, whether that's gold or something else. OK, 9.16. We're getting, you know, to the end of the questions, I think. <laughs> Peter Smith says, how can I come and work for you? <laughs> um, yeah, well, you know, we sort of... We do this on a shoestring, right? So, so just um, to be clear, there is um, there isn't a lot of monkeys in the back room, right? It's basically John and myself, and um, you know Joe and a couple of other people who do various things. But um, yeah, okay. Question about do I trust Trump more than the Labour or the Libs? No, I don't trust any of them, frankly. Um, I have no confidence in the political class whatsoever. I'm afraid um, they have betrayed core beliefs, they've betrayed the broader society that they're part of and they're out for um, their own ends, I think, rather than the greater good of the society. That's the problem that I've got. So I come at it from the other way and think about it from the point of view of the community and you know what the community needs to be successful and to be able to um, do the things that it needs to do and wants to do. Um, it seems to me that the political class... It's just a, in a different world altogether. Marcel says, keen to hear more about risk weights and capital requirements. <laughs> so you're the one. <laughs> yeah, I did a post the other day on that. Um, you go and look at it about sheep and goats. Um, I will do a more detailed one on, on the risk weights. Somebody asked me the other day, 
show me how a bank balance sheet actually works and how the risk weights work. So that's on my list of things to do. So I'll come back to that. Um, what else have we got? Do you... <laughs> There's a question there about Benny Hill and Michael Pascoe in the same sentence, but I won't read that one out. Um, this is from Genevieve. An independent builder friend of mine asked when the market would bottom out, I guess two years before jumping into more building projects. It's difficult to know. I, I, I have got more and more data coming out from my surveys, particularly SME surveys, that builders are really struggling, particularly small builders. And they're, they're finding that the flow of work that they had is drying up. And therefore, it's much less easy than it was for them to be able to continue to run the business that they'd want. They're getting it harder, finding it harder to, to borrow from the banks as well. Um, I don't know whether it'll be two years or whether it'll be longer. It depends on whether we have a deep sort of quick fall or whether we have a slow slide. Um, there is very little evidence that I'm seeing of demand picking up for new property. We've still got a lot of property supply. It's even worse in New Zealand from what Joe has been showing in recent videos. There is a massive supply. Demand is quite weak at the moment. And we do have population growth, of course, and that's that's something. So, yeah, it could be two years. It could be a bit longer, I think. Peter Smith says, a politician's, politician's job is to get elected and then to get re-elected. I agree. Absolutely, that's the problem. It's a self-perpetuating engine rather than actually thinking about what's really appropriate and good. You know, if, if, you, were, if you were sort of starting again, what you would want to do is is to think about a more strategic view of how to you know, develop the country and the economy and to, you know, to, to lay out a, a plan that would take us somewhere into the future rather than actually being limited by the short-term electoral cycle, which basically is you tighten them for the first couple of years, then you actually give more money out and try and get re-elected. You know, look at the MIEFA with the nine billion of um, you know, spending that will be coming through to try and bribe people to, to vote them back in again. It really does not service service us so well, in my view, but that's just you know, my own perspective. Okay, well, we're close to the end. Anything else? That... Have a look, see if I've missed anything. Okay, what I'm going to do is... <laughs> so Bruce says, just buy US dollars or euros from the bank. Well, well the US dollar, you know, look at the US dollar movements. Um, you know, it is it is quite a strong... Um, economy at the moment whether it will be in a few months time and whether the Fed will actually lift rates there's a really interesting question in my mind as to whether they will um, you know with all the stock market shenanigans in the recent days could they put it off or are they wired in to do it I suspect they probably will do it in December and then hold their breath after that but who knows okay Ben says will Australians start to pay more attention to labour pay conditions now that they will have to rely on wages instead of capital growth for advancement. Well, it's a very interesting question, Ben. Yeah, it really does come back to how the economy works and what's important. We've had the financialization of our economy for a generation or two. In other words, capital growth, easy money, prices going up, home prices going up, you know, saving for retirement in our homes and those sorts of things. I think that could well be now moving to a different phase where we're not going to see those same growth. I've, the number of people are still saying to me, house prices double every seven years, as though that's sort of the gospel according to everybody. Um, my own view is that's no longer true, and therefore we need alternatives. Um, it does come back to what's a fair wage? How do we actually um, develop an economy that actually is, is providing you know, a better level of support for people, I think? There's a bunch of very big picture questions which I can't answer on, on the stream tonight. Okay. Right, well, I am just going now to uh, go back and uh, tie up the ribbons on this, and I'll come back and have a last look at the... Um, uh, let's go there. Okay, so now just uh, a few final points. Um, look, if you like what you see here, um, we do really appreciate support. We have a lot of people now supporting us, 180 via Patreon. We had 29 new people in the month. Um, tremendous. Thank you for that. Um, it really does make a big difference to the um, 
uh, way that we actually go about things. So Patreon is there. I know some people don't particularly like Patreon because of some of the, the way that they do things. Um, there are alternatives that um, we can also talk about. But Patreon does exist. Um, and here's the, um, the, the slide now. Um, so um, 29 new people supporting us. Thank you. There's also an, a, a new tier as well that, um, that allows you to put a little more in. Um, so that's one option. There's another option as well, which is um, the PayPal Pay Me. Um, so that's um, something which we've started quite recently. It's been quite popular. So thank you very much for those who chosen to go the PayPal route. That's sort of an one one off donation. This really does make a huge difference to us because there are costs involved in just creating all the shows and doing all the other stuff that we do. Every dollar that we receive goes back into the production of more things. So it's not you know making profits and money. It's it's just helping to keep the thing ticking over. So please do consider that. We do really appreciate um, all the support we're getting. And I, I will also say that uh, I've had a few people um, make other gestures too. And you know I really appreciate every every person who's signified in various ways their appreciation of what we've been doing um, and I also appreciate all the emails and all the questions and all the uh, copy of correspondence that we receive it really helps to build out the story just a few top hits this month um, so this is um, basically uh, you know the, the slide the shows have done really well over this last month there was Edwin Almeida's um, latest uh, came out yesterday sage advice for our property for the property market wonderful conversation with edwin worth watching uh, joe did a great piece on baby boomers and the time bomb very popular show um worth watching if you've not seen it um we had of course the john adams assassination and the establishment strikes back i'm sorry if i shocked a few people on that one but actually <laughs> it was a very popular one too um the mortgage stress that we publish each month um that proved very popular too uh, and then i did a show on the mortgage ripoff where i looked at the um productivity commission report on the mortgage industry and the way that uh, there's no loyalty and then finally the bank risk the separating the sheep from the goats post that came out a couple of nights ago that was the one where i tried to look at the risk profiles of different classes of banks because we can't really get more detailed information than that so that's just some of the ones that are actually uh, most popular um so I'm just going to go back to this one. That's pretty much um, uh, what I'm going to, um, I think, cover tonight. Um, I'll just uh, go back one more time in case there's anything else that people have asked. What about crypto? Yes, um, good question. Uh, I'm looking at getting crypto as an alternative um, uh, mechanism, potentially. Um, there's a little bit of thing I have to do to, to, to do that, but I am looking to, to do that. So hopefully we'll be able to do uh, crypto a little bit down the track. Um, as you say, it is censorship proof, <laughs> which is, yeah. Um, so I just want to say then thank you to each of you and every one of you who've participated through the year on the DFA. We've had a, an amazing journey, right? Because essentially we started with few hundred at the beginning of the year we've got nearly 12,000 now people who are actually are part of the community and I very value very much value the cor correspondence and the conversations and everything else I'm going to close out tonight with my thoughts on 2019 so my expectation is that we will continue to see home prices fall the likelihood is that we will see significantly faster falls in the first half of the year and then I think we'll have to take a checkpoint um, in the, around the middle of 2019 as to whether it's going to be effectively a continuation or whether we begin to recover. That will be partly driven by what happens internationally. I am concerned about the US. I think that we could well see um, that falling into a difficulty later, although the inverted yield curve is marginal at the moment. I am very concerned about what's happening with regard to Brexit. I think that has some triggers as well. And I'm concerned about China. So there is international things. But locally, I'm afraid that I think the home price uh, movements will continue. And what that means is that people need to be cautious about um, getting into the market at the moment. And as Edwin said the other day, you know, depending on exactly which type of um, purchase you are, or probably only you are, you perhaps will do different things. So that's my sort of thoughts. Um, there will be some more material coming out over the next few days um which will continue through the holiday period of maybe 
maybe I won't promise to do it every day, but I will try and do it every day because I've still got this promise to get it through to the end of the year. So that's my plan. So again, thank you for all your participation, your comments and questions. If there's something that I missed, feel free to um, send me an email and I'll try and follow up specifically afterwards. Um, somebody asked me about Canberra. I haven't had a chance to look into Canberra, but I will do because I know people were interested in Canberra. I suspect prices will slide there. Supply is definitely continuing to grow. Demand is tailoring off. And, um, of course, we've got the election next year, so I suspect Canberra could be uh, another market to look at uh, in, in, in the coming months. And, by the way, I also think Perth is going to continue to slide as well. Um, I think the uh, likelihood is that um, even Adelaide and even Tasmania will continue to, to slide. And I think New Zealand is probably in for a bit of a wobbly time too, but... Uh, We'll let Joe tell that story in the next uh, few posts because there are some early warning signs there as well. So I hope that you all have a restful um, seasonal break over the next few days and weeks. And um, we'll be back in 2019 with more stuff. There'll be another live stream um, probably um, around the third week of January. Um, and uh, we'll continue our work we think it's important, a lot of important messages to get out there, and not least, don't necessarily believe everything you read in the mainstream media with regard to finance and property, because it's not the full story. So, with that, I think we are done. So thank you once again, and uh, I'm now going to play out with the end screen music. So thanks for watching, thanks for your participation. Have a good Christmas and New Year, and we'll see you again soon.